Well, hello everyone and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call. Let's jump right into it. This package comes from Nicholas in St. Lambert, Quebec, which of course is Canada. Hi to all my Canadian viewers. Of course, I was born in the province of Quebec in uh, Montreal or Montreal as it's called. I know people have talked about this before in the comments, but I was born to an Anglo family or English speaking family. So English is my native spoken tongue from when I was a kid. Of course, I learned French living in Quebec, but I moved to the United States when I was about uh, 11 years old. So my French skills are limited, so to speak. Before I fully open this, I think it's time to enjoy some pickled flavored soda from uh, Lester's Fixins here. Uh, I recently have been trying out some of these uh, weird sodas and this one, well, it's um, very pickle briny color, although looks almost like Mountain Dew here. It does say at the bottom here that it's pure cane sugar. Y'all get your fixins in an American Southern accent. Looks like looking at the ingredients here that this does not have any actual pickle juice in it. It is purely sugar with some artificial flavor that is meant to taste like pickles, I guess. I hope it doesn't taste like pickle brine because that's not something I'd really want to drink. I mean, I love pickles. I mean, who doesn't like pickles? I mean, I love them, but uh, pickle brine drinking that? Mm, no, not so much. Let's see how this tastes. All right, well, just as this came close to my nose, I had a whiff of pickles. And um, I have to say that this kind of does taste like pickle brine, but a very sweet version without the acid, without the vinegar in it that most pickles are made with. By the time you see this video, I think I will have already had dirt soda, lawn soda, and now this pickle soda. And I have to say, the dirt and the grass ones are really good and very enjoyable. This one, mm, not so much. I mean, the, the sweet pickle taste is a bit too realistic, so to speak. So not quite sure about that, but I will drink the entire thing. It is carbonated. Interesting, yeah, very unusual. All right, we have a letter inside here. All right, and the letter is in French, all of it. <laughs> All right, so I'm not gonna read this out loud in French. I'm just gonna try to translate it. Hi, Adrian. I know your Spanish is better than your French, but I don't think it should be a problem here. I sent you a motherboard uh, that works or it functions, but it has a problem that I couldn't figure out. I think that you can try to fix it. Boy, this, <laughs> this feels like I'm really bad at this. It's a motherboard that is um, in demand or uh, like it's desirable. I th it's a Biostar MB8433UUD 2.0. The problem is as follows. The floppy disk controller gives an error at post after doing some research on Vogons, uh, that's the forums for uh, PCs and stuff like that, I decided to replace the Super I.O. chip, but that didn't fix the problem. So I replaced the chip a second time and still the same problem. <laughs> Toujours la même problème. I mean, <laughs> I can't believe I'm actually making some sense of this. After replacing the Super I.O., that caused two more problems. It's impossible to configure the COM ports in the BIOS and the settings don't reflect what's on the post screen. For example, if I turn off COM1, uh, the post screen still shows that COM1 is active. Alors voila, which is like, there you go. If you want to try repairing it, I think that would make a good troubleshooting or repair video on your channel. If you don't want to fix it or you can't fix it, I invite you to send it to another YouTuber who could give it a try. <laughs> Warning, the motherboard is configured for a Cyrix CPU. So be careful if you install an Intel CPU because I think the voltages aren't the same. This is the name of the thread on Vogans about the floppy controller. It's how to fix your dead onboard floppy controller. Written by another Canuck, by the way. <laughs> 
Also, I've included a can of poutine sauce, or poutine, as it's uh, called in Montreal. You always seem to get candy, so I thought I'd do something different. Also, I've included two t-shirts with logos of great uh, commercial institutions of Quebec. I think you should be able to recognize one of the two, the red one, but if you don't know what the blue one is, here's a hint, mini sip. Mini sip, I wonder what that is. Looking forward to chatting again, Nicholas from the South Shore. That's awesome, South Shore, that's in Montreal. All right, well, I think I translated that somewhat okay. I did not cheat, I'd use my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, words like motherboard and floppy controller are written in English because I have no idea if there's a French word for those. <laughs> I certainly um, wouldn't know what that is. So <laughs> I think I earned a sip of pickle flavored soda. Oh. All right. Well, here is the can right from Canada. It's poutine sauce. So for those of you who don't know, Poutine is basically French fries or chips as they're called outside of the US and Canada, covered in gravy and cheese curds. Really delicious. It's really tasty and actually, let's see if I can get a picture here. It's pretty yummy and, oh look, it even says it's simply delicious and simply delicious in French as well. And it looks like the instructions are just heat and serve. So of course you'd make some french fries, you'd get some cheese curds, and you'd pour this over the whole lot of them. And yes, of course, this is made in Canada. None of this made in the US stuff. All right, this is the t-shirts here. This is not a message that was handwritten here. Something to do with tea public. We'll look at that as set in a second. Let's check out this motherboard here. All right, here is the motherboard. So this is it, this is the Biostar board. Now, one thing that I think makes this quite sought after is it's a 486 motherboard, but it has PCI slots and built-in I.O. along with 72 pin memory. So it's very easy to upgrade your 486 all the way up to like a ton of memory capacity. Built-in cache memory, and it's not the fake type. It's got a Dallas 12887 plus clock chip. I think this might've been replaced, so this probably works. And this right here, that was most likely the IC that he swapped out. And yeah, looking at the bottom here, there's a bit of Sharpie on the board there. And I wonder what's the deal with this bodge right here? What's up with this? Now what makes working on boards like this so difficult is they are multi-layer PCBs. And that means that there's no battery leakage on here. So I don't think that's gonna be a problem, but the multi-layer PCB makes tracing things extra difficult because sometimes things will just go and they'll disappear. And this board might have a ground to like a five volt power plane and that's it, but it also may be running data traces inside. When the board is this small and compact, it's pretty much all you can do to get everything routed on it because there's just not space around all of these components. So you have to use those inside layers. All right, I decided to fire up the old microscope here, and I don't normally do multi-camera shoots for a super mini mail call, but I figure this will be a good excuse. All right, here we are, and this right here is the multi-IO chip that was replaced. So what I wanted to do is try to take a look at the pins here to see if they were looking good from a solder perspective. These ones look fine, and this looks okay right here as is down here. But I'm noticing here we have a bit of an alignment problem. Could well be that some of these pins aren't making contact uh, with the traces there. Now, unfortunately with a motherboard like this, it's really difficult to tone out because these traces run off kind of underneath other components and stuff. So it's not easy to access them. Everything looks fine over here. There's just a little bit of stuff on there. I think what you see here is just some flux residue that's on everything here, shouldn't be a problem. And up here, there's also alignment issues. Let's see if I can tone out a couple of these pins here. So that one's working. That one's good. That one's okay as well. Yeah, toning these out, everything seems totally fine, even though there's a misalignment Seems like the connections are all solid on this. 
and everything seems fine on the other side as well. I noticed this one capacitor over here that looks a little sketchy, but I think it's probably okay. There's just a bunch of flux on there. It's okay otherwise. This is that bodge wire on the underside, and I'm guessing that this trace here got damaged right there, and this bodge was necessary to connect it. See, the trace goes underneath here and loops around to right there. So I guess that's what this is all about. And it's definitely connected fine. I did see that this board has a scratch on it right here, but it doesn't look like it actually made its way through any of the traces there. Uh, I don't know, actually. Let's see here, right here. No, that's connected. These all look connected. That one's connected as well. Sometimes without the microscope, it's just really hard to see stuff like this to know if those are broken traces or not. So uh, you need very sharp probes like these to actually test right through the solder mask to make sure that it's not broken. But that is definitely a scratch, but it's fine. Okay, and I'm realizing now that the reason for that bodge wire was because someone had removed um, this uh, Dallas semiconductor clock chip or the IC here and uh, potentially to cause some damage here. So let's make sure that these are all good. That's fine. This right here doesn't look so great. That's the damage right there caused from the removal. That one is fine. How about this one here? Goes over here, that's good. That one looks fine. That one is good. These ones, <laughs> they look pretty rough. That's okay. And here is the other side, and look at that. This copper is exposed right here. but it's still connected fine. Well, from this side, everything looks fine. The problem is we don't know what kind of damage has been caused on the other side. All right, so I popped out the Dallas chip and um, let's see what we see here. Interesting, I assume this socket was a skinny socket and it's been cut here to uh, allow this to work in this wider uh, spacing. Now what's this here? Okay, that's nothing, that just comes right off. Now, unfortunately, you can't really see what's happening underneath this socket here, right? So it could be damaged there. I just did some quick toning out of pins from the floppy connector here and they definitely go to this multi IO chip here, the super IO. So that chip definitely controls the floppy controller. It's pretty hard to trace because this is the back side of the board for the floppy controller. These are the signal pins. They go under the SIM sockets to some vias right here. And then you can't really see where these go, except I assume it's these traces that run right along here. Those do make their way over to this chip. All right, well, let's give this a quick test. I don't have a Cyrix 46 handy, but I have this AMD DX280. This should work, I think. Well, actually, I just went in my parts bin, and I do have a Cyrix 46 DX266. So this is what I'm gonna install in here, because I forgot on these old motherboards, the jumpers, oh, so many jumpers. 15, 16, 17. I'm just going over the jumpers here just to double check that looks like it's set for 66 megahertz, which is what the CPU is. So closed, closed, closed. Cyrix 46 DX2, two and three. Actually going over this, it doesn't look like it's set for a Cyrix CPU either. These two are on one and two, one and two, which like one and two, one and two. That's set to open JP46 or JP45 is on one and two. And then one and two and four and five, it looks like it's set for an 8046, Intel 46 DX4 actually. So it looks like to change this over to Cyrix, I leave those. And all I need to do is change this one here to two and three. 
And then RN11 not installed. There is no RN11 on this motherboard. Must be uh, for a different version. RN12 not installed, not installed. And let's look at the 46DX4. Yeah, okay, it's definitely set up for a DX4. So DX2 is installed, installed, not installed, not installed. So that matches. And there's a voltage selection. 36, 37, and 39, that's these jumpers. And they're all set for two and three, which means that it's 3.45 volts, which I'm pretty sure is what this CPU runs on. All right, anyways, let's plug in the postcard here. And let's get some RAM. Let me turn this all so the camera can see. Here we go. Oh, come on. We're not getting we're not getting the right voltages on here. There we go. I think the slot, this slot was bad. C3? Oh yeah, this, this ISA slot is flaky. Deoxit to the rescue. Let's try that again. Much better. All right, at least the CPU is executing. It's doing something, although that doesn't... Oh wait, maybe it's working. I don't think it's initialized the video card, but that could be the same problem. So, put some deoxid in the socket here. Okay, let's try again. I do have the speaker hooked up too. Don't hear anything. And we're getting no image whatsoever. So I don't think this thing is posting correctly. The fact that it's not even beeping is quite disturbing. And why is it starting at C1? What is wrong with this board? Let's see what happens when we take the RAM out. This memory might be bad. Okay, well, at least we're getting a beep because the RAM is not installed. So that's normal. And part of the problem is the BIOS that's on here, which is right there, it has no sticker on it. So I have no idea what kind of BIOS is on this board. So to look up these codes, it's not really something I can do. Not without knowing the exact type of BIOS. I got a keyboard plugged in. Let's just see if it has any response. I mean, it initializes the power. C3, if I hit control delete, it's, the keyboard is not responding at all. Oh, I just realized I had the clock chip out. Let's uh, see if this works with the clock chip in. Oh, we got a six. Oh, look at that, it actually initialized. Wow. It doesn't work with the clock chip removed? That's weird. I guess that's normal, right? All right, very quickly, it kind of went to the BIOS. It said the floppy drive failed. I'll just set that for none for a sec here. In fact, uh, let's just reset this whole thing to BIOS, setup defaults. Oh, 100 megahertz, what? This is definitely not a 100 megahertz chip. And the computer just locked up there. Yeah, definitely something is messed up here because I'm pretty sure it said that there were two COM ports and no parallel port. And it's definitely set to parallel here. Let's disable everything. And look, it still says there's two serial ports and no parallel port. Let's plug in the XTIDE card. And it's not even seeing the XTIDE. This machine is seriously problematic. I don't get it. And it's stuck on this updating ESCD. I'm gonna set the jumper here to clear the Dallas uh, CMOS clock battery thing here. Let's see if that uh, does anything. I gotta say, it doesn't seem like it cleared anything. These are all the same settings I left it with. All right, so I fiddled around and nothing I do changes anything here. If some of the settings are retained, like I disabled the floppy drive, but the serial port stuff isn't. So I don't really know what's going on there. I happen to have another Dallas chip. This is an original one. It's not the plus variant. Uh, this one most likely has a dead battery on it, but it's worth a try. All right, and it looks like it's not posting. Uh, maybe it's posting. Oh, it took a long time to post. All right, look at that. It says it's a Pentium Pro now at 66 megahertz. All right, well, uh, it's definitely reset here. All right, well, 
Let's uh, see what happens. See what happens. All right, CMOS battery failed, that's fine. Floppy drive failure, C0. That's uh, what Nicholas said was the original error. Will this even boot? Uh, wow. Look at this XT IDE error. <laughs> what is happening with this machine? It is very unhappy. Flashing. <laughs> At least it's trying to use the XT IDE now. That's, that's actually an improvement over what it was doing before. You know, part of me thinks that the problem on this might be that the BIOS image is just wrong. Um, I don't know, UUD, there's a, there's, a, there's a part number there. I don't know if that's even the right thing for this motherboard. At least it's actually trying to boot the machine though. That's something. I hooked up a floppy drive to this. Let's see if it actually attempts a boot now that it's trying to boot. No. No, it just says floppy drive failure, same thing. All right, well, it's at least detecting the... I plugged, all right, I plugged the compact flash card directly uh, into the motherboard, and it is seeing that. <laughs> but when it tries to boot, it just puts this garbage on here. Okay, let's try to read out this chip here. So I have this in my uh, Mini Pro. Definitely reads okay. We'll just save the file here, a rig bios.bin. And I downloaded two BIOS files here. And let's see, we'll copy them in there. They're both 128K. I don't know which is which. We'll just try this first one here. And let's do a verify to see if this is different. Okay, there's some slight differences in it. Let's load the other file. And let's see what this one looks like if it verifies. Oh, that one's different as well. Could be just different versions. It seems like it's mostly the same, right? Let's try the first one again. Erase. And we'll program. I found this here, Biostar A433UUD, last official BIOS. That is definitely what this motherboard is right here. Okay, flash chip is back in. Let's power this up. Okay, we're posting. Setup defaults. Still says Pentium Pro and floppy failure. Everything is failing in exactly the same way. Blanks out now. It doesn't even attempt to boot. Yeah, very interesting. It just hangs uh, postcode 61. <laughs> it's uh, definitely a problem. I'm gonna go back to the uh, Dallas clock that obviously works. And this one goes and just hangs at updating ESCD. I swapped over to the other BIOS file of the two that were in that zip file. Let's see if this makes any difference. I'm not holding my breath. And it froze in exactly the same way. It's weird how switching out the Dallas chip causes it to act so differently. It's really smelling like there's a BIOS problem on this board. And I'm really wondering if the file I downloaded is for the version one of this motherboard, and this is a version two motherboard, which maybe has slightly different chipset or something on here. And I'm reading through the thread on Vogans, and um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, Nothing really sticks out at me that there's a problem here. Yeah, it just seems like there's a couple people that have the problem with the floppy drive and replacing that chip doesn't seem to fix it. All well, this person says, yeah, if they replace that IC, uh, that it started working again. Still reading through the thread here. It's interesting because it says Biostar MB8433 UUD version 2014. And let's watch this boot up here. What, what is this? This part number. And what is this? UUD 960520S. That does not match. So it's a similar error that this person, Treeman here, is getting in uh, from Australia, but his BIOS at least is showing the right motherboard. Yeah, and that's the end of the thread. I mean, uh, nothing really conclusive other than multiple users posted pictures here and they all say Biostar right there. And, and the BIOS images that I have tried on this motherboard don't say that. So 
Uh, I don't know. I'm really suspecting that some of the issues might be that. I mean, the floppy drive is probably still dead, but the weird COM port issue could be that. Oh, look, I actually just got it booting. <laughs> Something I saw in one of the threads said, if you're using EDO memory, which I guess this is, you have to set that in the BIOS, otherwise it won't boot. First I wanna see is it's actually running at 100 megahertz. Uh, hmm, that doesn't help us, does it? Try the good old check CPU. Nope, it's running at 66 megahertz. So that is fine. And indeed, check it is showing that COM1 and 2 are active and the parallel port is not there. And definitely the A drive is not working and I did have all the onboard components enabled and still that error. Let's just try turning everything off and it still shows serial ports and no parallel port. And it definitely reports to the COM ports are there and check it. Okay, so the floppy drive just fails every time as, as it's been doing. What I wanna test is using a floppy drive controller just to see if the floppy drive is even there, like the hardware, because if the chip is responding on the IO port that the floppy controller's on, then you plugging this in will cause a bus conflict and generally is not gonna work. But when I plug this in, if everything just works normally um, with the floppy connected to this, then I think the problem was probably somewhere in the chip select logic for that smart floppy controller multi IO chip. Look at that. Floppy drive spun. Didn't really do anything though, didn't access. We get floppy drive fail 40 now, and right away just not ready. I'm just gonna disable the floppy drive controller in the BIOS here. Let's see if this actually seeks now. It's not seeking, it's doing the same thing. It just spun, but that was it and we're getting floppy drive fail 40. I did some searching for this multi IO chip and I saw that there were some ISA cards that use the same chip and it looks like this chip as well, these two together to provide the same functionality, floppy, serial, parallel, and hard drive controller all on one card. And obviously on that card, it uses jumpers to configure the options for these. And on this board, that's not happening. So it's clear that something else configures these chips to enable and disable the various features. That functionality really can't come from anywhere other than the chipset. So the chipset for this board must have been designed um, with controlling this multi IO capability in mind. Therefore, it is my hunch that there is a problem with the chipset on this board specifically. And reading that thread, it sounded like everything was working perfectly on this board and one day it just kind of stopped working. In addition, I think that this uh, multi IO chip here was replaced with a slightly different part than the original one that was on the board. People said that uh, it seemed that um, the different boards use the different parts on there. It's not always the same one. It's unknown if these are pin compatible with each other. Maybe you can swap them, but there are other subtle changes, like some values are different, or maybe some of these components are installed but it's quite possible that some of this multi IO functionality is also controlled by those parts and swapping this from, I think it was an A B part to a B F part, the last digits on the UMC part there, maybe that requires other changes, which could account for why the serial ports are now stuck. But I am pretty sure that it's gonna be the chipset itself that is turning off and on the functionality there and that there is a fault in the main chipset on this board. And in that case, there's really no point to try to fix it. Now, to make this a usable board again, perhaps what I should do is just remove the multi IO chip altogether, which should have the effect of just disabling all these onboard ports, which is okay because you could just use a PCI IDE card and then you can just use a serial parallel floppy controller in one of these ISA slots and you'd be working. But the problem is with it right now is it's sort of in this half enabled state and we saw the floppy drive doesn't work with a card and the serial ports are definitely not gonna work because this thing is, is always activating the serial ports even when you have them turned off. So I think the only way to fix this thing is just to yank this chip off and just leave it off and hope that this thing works fine. I think this board should work perfectly without that chip installed. If anyone has ideas about what might be wrong with this board, definitely please let me know if you can find data sheets for uh, this chip here 
or the main chipset on here, that would be very helpful as well because we'll be able to tell from the chipset documentation if it indeed is controlling that I.O. chip. As I said, removing that chip will at least result in a fully functional motherboard just with missing features and just require an extra card for that functionality that's lost, but you'd still have a very fast 46 motherboard, which I think is the allure of this particular board. It's just one of the fastest, most CPU supporting 46 boards out there. Okay, I did all that testing and I forgot to take a look at the t-shirts. All right, let's see what we got here. Hmm, the first one is Steinberg. I kind of think this was a supermarket. Not sure, I don't really remember actually. I'll have to look that up. Ah, uh, one thing that kind of blows is it's an XL shirt and I wear large usually. Sometimes I wear medium shirts, but large is lately because I've COVID weight is what I wear. And if it's a slimmer fitting shirt, then large is definitely it because once I wash it, it kind of shrinks. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, XL is, is unlikely to fit. Oh, well, this is, um, oh, I thought I remembered this one. It kind of reminds me of the Lawson logo a little bit, which is a convenience store chain, but that is definitely not what this is. And it's got a P on it. So yeah, I don't really know. If anyone recognizes this shirt or this one here, the Steinberg logo, please let me know. All right, well, my bench is a total disaster. Thank you, Nicholas, for sending in this board. It was sort of fun to play around with it. It is way too late. I need to get to bed. So that is gonna be it. I wanna thank all my patrons for the support to the channel. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the link in, in the link at the description below. Um, I'll put a link to this, uh, the Vogons thread for this motherboard down below. So if anyone wants to see it themselves, they can read through it. And then all the usual YouTube subscribe, uh, thumbs up, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess that is that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.